Okay, so welcome to today's Archer virtual tutorial, um, which is going to be a, a double bill by myself, uh, Ian Methune and Oliver Henrich here uh, on the topic of multi-resolution modeling of biological systems in labs. So for the first half of the talk, I'm going to talk about some uh, work that we've done uh, under the Archer ECSE program. And so I thought I'd just start with a couple of slides outlining that for the uh, purposes of anyone who hasn't heard the details on it before, and um, before talking uh, specifically about the project um, that, that I've been working on uh, over the last year. Uh, so just by way of reminder, uh, what the Archer ECSE program is, is it's a funding scheme uh, to provide support for the Archer user community to help develop software to be used on the Archer. It covers a range of things, uh, including improvements to algorithms, uh, new methods, uh, improving scalability, uh, all with the aim of allowing new science to be done on Archer. Um, and the projects there are typically uh, reasonably short, about three months to a year. Uh, if you're interested in applying, the next call will close at the end of January. Uh, next year. Uh, if you want to find out more, there's lots of information on the Archer website um, and there was a webinar that went through all this including the application process in detail last month and you can find that on the web. So uh, without further ado then, on to the, the project that I wanted to talk about. Um, so this is a, a, an ECSE project um, that came from the January 2015 call. Uh, the PI uh, project is Jonathan Essex from uh, Southampton in the Department of Chemistry there. And uh, this project had six early months of effort funded, um, which I uh, carried out over the period summer of 2015 to 2016. So this project has now just finished. Um, and the objective of the project was to uh, implement um, a force field uh, called ELBA. Uh, in lamps um, so that you can carry out calculations using this force field in a uh, faster and more reliably than was uh, presently possible. Uh, there's two main aspects to that. Uh, one was the development of some new uh, integrators uh, for molecular dynamics and then also some work on the parallel load balancing uh, so you can get uh, better scalability and faster simulations using lamps. So I don't want to go into too much detail about exactly the ins and outs of the Elba force field, um, but what it is, uh, it's a, a coarse grained force field uh, with an emphasis on electrostatic interactions. So that's where the name uh, Elba comes from. Uh, the original publication uh, from John and also uh, his uh, postdoc, uh, Mario Orsi, in 2011 describes all the details. But as you can see from the diagram uh, on the slide here, um, whereas with an atomistic simulation, so this is a, a, a lipid molecule you might find in a, a, a bilayer like a cell wall, for example. Um, if you modeled all the atoms in a classical microdynamics type simulation, there'd be 138 atoms in it. In the ELBA model, the, the atoms are grouped uh, into what are sometimes called beads, so little spherical particles. Um, so these ones in the tail here. Uh, typically represent six individual atoms um, or, or maybe some larger ones in the head groups here. These beads, and they're all spheres, they can have uh, charges associated with them, such as these choline and phosphate groups, um, or they can have dipoles, point dipoles attached to them as well. Uh, so the beads uh, interact with each other uh, via bonded interactions and they also interact electrostatically. Uh, so as this example shows, you can cut down the number of uh, particles that you actually need to simulate. So there's a, around about a factor of 10 improvement there. Uh, there's also a performance enhancement that comes from the fact that because the particles are in are now more massive, you can use a larger molecular dynamics time step. So there's a double gain to be had there. Uh, the ELBA force field originally uh, was designed for studying these, uh, these lipid molecules, um, but it's more recently been applied to uh, to other uh, biological simulation problems uh, for a whole range of different uh, biomolecules and other small molecules. In contrast to some other uh, coarse grained force fields, it includes explicit solvent where there's a, a water molecule which has one uh, bead per water molecule with a dipole attached to it. Uh, 
that. So that's our water model in the hill bar. And um, what's uh, maybe somewhat unique, more unique about this force field is that it allows you to also include atomistic detail as well as the coarse grain beads. Uh, so that's the, the dual resolution aspect in the title of the project. Um, so for example, a common usage would be to have a, uh, a biomolecule described in atomistic detail using a standard biomolecular force field like CHARM, and then embedding that in an environment uh, made up of Elmer beads. So you get the, the detail uh, where you want it, and you get the uh, lowered computational cost of course screening in the parts of the system that are maybe less physically important. So this uh, ELBA model uh, was first implemented in a code called BRAMS, and uh, so the code for that is still available. Um, but the basic problem with this is that um, it's not widely used at all, really, outside John and uh, Mario's groups. Um, it was only really developed uh, initially by Mario, and in fact, there has been no updates to it, I think, since 2012. Um, it doesn't have any parallelization in it, so that limits you in practice to studying relatively small systems. And, and of course, when you're thinking about using a coarse grain model, you typically want to study things over uh, long time scales or for large systems, so you want the code which runs, uh, runs quickly. So the idea of the project was to um, take all the pieces that you need to do an ELBA simulation and implement them into LAMPS. Um, the reason LAMPS is chosen was because most of the particle-particle uh, -particle interactions that you need were already uh, implemented inside of LAMPS. It has support natively for, uh, for spherical particles and it also has ability for multiple time stepping using the RESPA algorithm. Uh, so this is a, the idea where not only uh, do you, can you have uh, a combination of coarse grain and atomistic particles, um, but you can integrate uh, and compute the forces on the atomistic particles more frequently than the larger, slower moving coarse grain particles. Uh, so you can have not just a single time step, but a shorter time step for the more detailed part of the systems. And in addition to this, it's also a good idea, uh, you know, if you want your, your method to be more widely used, and to have it implemented in a, a code which already has a very large user base and has uh, you know, a lot of work on it in terms of parallelization and so it gets good scalability, it's easily portable to many different platforms. So that was the idea of the project. Um, to dig in a little bit to the details of, of, of what I did, um, so if you're using uh, spherical particles in LAMPS, uh, one of the integrators that's available to you uh, is this uh, fix in the sphere. So fix in lamps is just a, a method which is applied uh, to some set of particles uh, every time step uh, to integrate them uh, from one step to another. Um, and one of the things that was found that led to this uh, project proposal being written in the first place was that the NV sphere integrator doesn't conserve energy very well. Um, so what we decided to do is to implement a different integrator scheme called DLM after Dole, Weber, Langer, and McLachlan, who developed the method, um, which has better energy conservation properties. Uh, and this is the integrator that's used in the Brahms code. And um, so, really, what it involves uh, is just a modification to the uh, integration of the rotational uh, degrees of freedom, uh, so which direction the dipole vector of, of the particles is pointing. Um, the, the uh, translational degrees of freedom, you just integrate in the, the same way uh, as, you, as normal. Um, but for the rotational degrees of freedom, uh, what we do is starting from this dipole vector, we build a rotation matrix that says which direction the, the particle is pointing in, um, and then apply a series of uh, rotations around each local axis of the particle. So rotation uh, around X, rotation around Y, rotation around Z, and then uh, another rotation around Y and a final rotation which should be around X there, yeah. And so, and, and by doing this scheme, you, you come up with a, a new rotation matrix, which you then apply uh, to a unit vector in the Z direction to get back your new dipole. So this way of getting from uh, the, the, the dipole at time uh, T to time T plus DT uh, gives you much better energy conservation properties uh, than the, the method which was implemented in beforehand in labs. Uh, so just to give you an example of what difference that really makes, um, so here's some simulation data from a short simulation uh, of a, a box of water modeled using ELBA. 
Um, so that you can see that already with a 10 frame per second time step is the kind of time step you would like to be able to use with this coarse grain model. Um, we run uh, some periods uh, of 20 picoseconds here uh, where there's a thermostat that, uh, that pushes energy into the system to keep it at a fixed temperature. Uh, and then, so this is basically an equilibration period, and then the thermostat is turned off, and what you expect to get is constant energy, NVE dynamics. And what you can see here, uh, with the, the red and the, the purple lines, uh, is that as soon as the thermostat is turned off using the native lamps integrator, you get this big drift uh, from energy. It leaves some of the rotational degrees of freedom and goes into translational uh, degrees of freedom. Um, so, so clearly the energy is not reliably conserved here. If you use the, uh, the DLM method, which I implemented, uh, what you see is once the thermostat is turned off, the energy is nicely conserved um, as, you, as you would like. One of the other properties of the DLM integrator is that it does allow you to actually go to slightly larger time steps than you might otherwise be able to do. Uh, so this is some other simulation data taken um, from uh, Sam Kinhiden, who is formerly a postdoc um, at uh, Southampton and uh, the University of Gothenburg, uh, a simulation using the, the DLM integrator in lamps of 128 of these uh, PPMC, which are a particular uh, lipid molecule uh, solvated in water. Uh, and what you can see from this graph is that uh, actually, starting from a 10 frames per second time step, you can increase that quite substantially without any significant drift in energy. So really you can get to around about maybe 16, 15 or 16 uh, frames a seconds and still have a reasonably reliable simulation over a long period of time. Uh, as well as the, the constant energy integrator, the NV sphere, uh, this integrator has also been implemented as an extension to a, a bunch of other lamps fixes. Uh, so you can do constant temperature, uh, constant pressure and temperature or constant pressure uh, on solos as well, all by turning on this new keyword, which is update dipole slash DLM. Uh, so by default, you get the, uh, the old behavior uh, and you can add this keyword to, to get the, uh, the DLM integration scheme. So that, that was uh, all the new functionality that we implemented in the project uh, to allow you to do reliable simulations with ELBA. The other aspect was related to the parallel performance. Um, so in particular, the load balancing. So there, there's a load balancing uh, facility in LAMPS. So th this schematic, which is taken from the LAMPS website, shows you normally uh, all LAMPS does is it cuts up the simulation space uh, along, the, in this case, it's just in 2D, but generalizes to 3D. Uh, so you have one region per MPI process that you're using for your calculation. Uh, and clearly, if the, the particles in your simulation are not evenly distributed over the domain, um, then you have a load imbalance problem. Some processes have more work to do than others. Um, there's two methods that LAMS has to solve this. One is uh, what they call the shift load balancing scheme, where uh, the, there's still a 2D grid here of processes, but the divisions between the grids are, are moved from, uh, from side to side to try and balance the total load. Uh, and what you can see here is that this does improve things uh, to a certain extent, but there are still uh, regions which have no work to do. Um, and that can potentially occur depending on the, the distribution of particles over your simulation space. Uh, a better load balancing scheme in terms of getting a good load balance is based on recursive coordinate bisection. And the way this works is in each dimension in turn, you cut the simulation space in half so you have the same number of particles in each half of the space. Um, so that, that has a nice property that you get a very good load balance. So if you count the number of particles in each one of these resolving boxes, they will be very close to equal. Um, but what it does mean is that you don't have this nice uh, nearest neighbor communication pattern anymore. Uh, so rather than this, uh, this block uh, decomposition here, you have a more general thing which labs call a tile decomposition. And that implies more communication costs. And also some of the uh, functionality in LAMPS uh, is not implemented for use with the tile decomposition. So in particular, for our case, the uh, electrostatic solver that we want to use with ELBA is not implemented uh, for the tiled uh, communication style. Uh, so all the results I'll show so far, uh, or show further in the presentation, 
uh, are using the, the shift uh, type of load balancing, um, but the methods will still work. Uh, the modifications to the load balancing scheme will still work also with RCB, um, but in the end you get poorer performance because you're forced to use uh, a less efficient uh, electrostatic solver. The reason load balance becomes a problem for these dual resolution simulations uh, it comes basically from the fact that almost all of the computational cost unit calculations are force evaluations, and not all of the particles in our simulation are the same. So there'll be some atomistic particles and some of the coarse grain beads. Uh, and the interactions between them are different. Uh, so the computation of the force on a, uh, an atomistic particle uh, will typically be slightly more expensive than that of a bead. Uh, compounding that is this multiple time stepping algorithm. Uh, and there, if you're uh, calculating forces more frequently on the atomistic particles, then not only might they be more expensive, but they're done more often. So the, all of the load balancing uh, that was implemented in labs uh, already was based on just counting the numbers of particles. So if the amount of time taken per particle is not a constant, then clearly these schemes are not going to give uh, a good load balance. Uh, and so the, the idea that, that we had was to introduce uh, a biasing method essentially to the load balance. So rather than counting uh, individual particles, uh, you can wait, you can do a weighted count. And um, so the, the method we implemented uh, uses in LAMPS there's an existing functionality of defining groups. So in this case, for example, we can define a group uh, which is uh, the, the, all the particles in this group are considered to be in the solute according to the type of the particle. So in this simulation, uh, Particles of type one are the water beads, everything else is the solute. Uh, and then once you define those groups, you can use them in the load balancing command. This is an example one here. Uh, so, so balanced health labs, you're going to do some load balancing. Uh, you're going to load balance uh, if there is an imbalance of more than 10%. We're going to use the shift, uh, so the, the grid based uh, load balancing scheme in all three dimensions. Uh, these parameters just say how much time do you want to spend in load balancing, so you load balance until you get within 10% of the perfect load balance. And then this, uh, these last few parameters here are extensions that I added, so um, using a weighting scheme according to the, the particle groups, and we're going to have an additional weight for, uh, for one group, uh, so the, the particles in the solute group will count as 2.5 times as much as they otherwise would. Uh, so if you have more than, uh, and then all the particles which are in the, the water group continue to uh, count as one. If you have multiple different groups, and uh, you just have group two solute and some weight factor, and then another group name and another weight factor, so it's generalized as uh, quite straightforward. Uh, and then, so once you, you define these weightings, then that, that feeds into the existing uh, load balancing process, uh, either the, uh, the shift or the RCB. Uh, also in LAMPS now, uh, subsequent to the implementation of the, the group-based weighting that I did, uh, the LAMPS developers took this uh, and added a couple other things. You can also weight by the number of neighbors of a particle, um, or you can also weight by compute time. Um, so th this, you might think, is what you really want to do. You want to uh, work out how much time is taken associated with the particles in each process, but it doesn't give you quite that because uh, different particle types contribute to different parts of the computation. So for example, uh, if you have uh, water molecules, they have no bonded interactions between each other, they only interact by pair forces. Um, so even if you use the, the time-based weighting, you wouldn't get a perfect load balance still. Uh, it's still helpful uh, to use the group-based uh, weighting scheme. So you can kind of um, apply your knowledge about how you know your, your problem is set up uh, to achieve a better load balance. They also put in a facility to define uh, your own variables, which uh, so there's a very general flexible syntax um, there. So you can you can weight uh, individual particles in any particular way that you, you choose to do so that it makes sense for your simulation. So just to give you some idea of what benefit you can get from this. And so these uh, performance data are from the simulation of uh, the BPTI, 
and this is a, a biomolecule group here with 882 atoms modeled atomistically using the charm force field and it's solvated in a box of just over 6,000 uh, water molecules using the Alba model. So this is a, a, a reasonably small system. Um, if you would model this uh, using, using all atom water, obviously it would be significantly bigger. Um, so here, this is just a, a performance metric uh, in nanoseconds per uh, or nanoseconds simulated time per uh, elapsed walk clock day. Uh, versus the number of processes. So higher is faster. Uh, what you can see here is the blue line is if you have no load balancing at all. Uh, the red line is if you use the, uh, the shift load balancing uh, algorithm with the D weight, so the weighting of one. And in this simulation, uh, so we've not used any R RESPA. So everything is being, uh, all the forces are being calculated at every time step. Even here, you can see that having a, some weighting towards the solute particles uh, so these shifts of one point uh, these weightings of 1.5 or 2 uh, do increase the performance slightly uh, maybe about about 10 percent over the, uh, the non-weighted load balance once you start to increase the, uh, the time step ratio so in this case uh, the solid particles, the forces on those are calculated every time step, um, but the, the pair forces between the water beads and also some of the dihedral uh, angular forces in the molecule are only computed every fourth step. And you can see here a couple of things. One is that uh, you can get good performance but with, with a higher weighting, so that is kind of expected if you've got a, a higher ratio between the, the the rates at which you compute different forces, then you'd expect to have to have a higher weighting for the more frequently computed uh, uh, particle forces. So here, shifts of 2 to 2.5 seem to give best performance, and also there's a larger speed up uh, over the, the non-weighted load balance. So this kind of says that the, the load balance that was being given uh, by the default scheme is worse uh, in the, the higher rest run times their patient cases. And, uh, as far as I tested, up to, uh, to eight femtoseconds uh, for the average time step, one femtosecond for the inner time step. Again, the same thing in theory, you can go to a much higher uh, higher weighting and also get higher speed ups. And this is something you know, that, that if you're setting up a simulation for yourself, you need to experiment with one of the best uh, weighting values to use uh, and look at where you're getting the best uh, parallel performance. So to summarize, um, so there's two new bits of functionality that have gone into the LAMPS code base. So one is these uh, DLM integrators uh, for the various uh, uh, molecular dynamics ensembles. Um, and these are now included in the latest uh, stable release of LAMPS. So from 30th of July, if you go to the LAMPS website, that's the one that you'll get. The load balancing uh, stuff that I just talked about uh, is included in a LAMPS patch release, so you can download that from the website if you look in the, the right place. Um, but both of these are included in a version of LAMPS which is being installed on Archer. Um, so there's a module called LAMPS slash ELBA, um, which will give you a version of LAMPS that has uh, the various packages and things that you need to set up a LAMPS simulation, uh, plus this new functionality, including the, uh, the load balancing stuff. If you want more information on any of this, uh, there's a technical report uh, on the Archer website under the white paper section, which gives all the uh, gory technical details of the implementation. Um, and there's a very nice uh, blog, which is maintained by uh, Sam Kim Hidden, who I mentioned earlier, um, which contains some tutorials more from a uh, sort of scientific standpoint of how to set up your simulation, uh, what sort of things you should look for, and how to generate your parameters. Uh, also references to the, uh, the important literature that you might want to read uh, when you start working with ELBA. Okay, so I'm going to stop there and uh, hand over to all of you. Thanks. So the second part of this webinar is on a different project. Uh, which has to code um, ECC 05 minus 10, so this was the fifth call. And the title is um, Adding Multiscale Models of DNA to LAMPS. 
Um, so beginning was September last year and the project terminated um, this year, end of August. And the people involved is myself as PI and uh, David and Maria Lutzo from the University of Edinburgh here in physics and uh, Thomas Aldridge from Imperial College uh, London, who is the main author of this um, a standalone version of the model and code. Um, what, uh, what we did was we implemented the OxDNA core screen model for um, single and double-stranded DNA into the LAMS code. And we also implemented new Langevin type uh, rigid body integrators. Um, the software that we created is available from CCP Forge and will be soon available as a LAMS user package. Uh, what we're working on currently is uh, to extend and port this uh, suite of utility software um, of a different standalone version of, um, of OxDNA so that it can be used together with the LAMS. So that might take a little few months to do. <clears throat> um, I want to start with some motivation. Why is it interesting to have coarse grade models of DNA? And uh, if you see like the, the human genome, um, the haploids, so that's like the, the 23 chromosomes, um, that contains uh, 3.2 billion base pairs. And there's an incredible amount of um, uh, information that's stored on there. And uh, the diameter of a double strand is uh, two nanometers. And the total length of this DNA, these uh, 3.2 billion base pairs, is about two meters in, uh, in each human cell. So if you take all the cells together and you get further than Pluto and back uh, for just one human being. And um, at the same time, what's quite remarkable is that um, if, you, if you take all this DNA and uh, compress it into a, a sphere uh, in the human cell, then the diameter of the sphere would be just two micrometers. So there's an, like two meter length, uh, two micrometers, so there's a, there's a, there's a million fold compression um, in it. And in order to achieve this uh, level of compression, um, there's, a, there's a hierarchical uh, organization of DNA. So it starts with um, a double strand, uh, of course, and then uh, there are these um, histone proteins, so eight of them form uh, uh, nucleosomes. And then the DNA wraps around roughly like uh, one and two thirds of a turn. Uh, and this is roughly two in the base pairs uh, that uh, wraps around one of those nucleosomes. And then these nucleosomes uh, form a 30 nanometer strand, uh, which is called chromatin fiber. And then this chromatin fiber organizes eventually um, into chromosomes. Um, to give you an idea where the, the computational challenge is, is um, uh, one of those loops that you see here of chromatin fiber. So first of all, this process of um, the, the nucleosomes um, and this 30 nanometer strand uh, requires really big systems. And then one of those loops is already 50 um, kilobase pairs. So there's definitely some uh, um, need for um, yeah, efficient computational models to, to, to bridge these scales. Um, atomistic simulation of DNA has been very successful over the last 20 years, you have to say. And um, it's very good uh, for capturing very fast conformational changes um, that the DNA undergoes. If you look at the bottom right, uh, there's this A, B, and Z DNA, which is three of the most common uh, conformations. And uh, for example, the, the, you can, you can uh, have transitions between these conformations depending on how you overstretch uh, or twist um, or under twist the strand. Um, you have uh, for roughly between 24 and 28, if I remember correctly, atoms per um, uh, nucleotide. And uh, that means this is, uh, this is quite a big simulation. Usually you're limited to something like 1,000 base pairs in atomistic simulations. And this is still relatively uh, short strands. Uh, what these models, despite their success, are unable to um, cover is uh, larger length and time scales that are, for example, important for DNA supercoiling or how these nucleosome core particles are positioned on the, on the strand. So that's something that is uh, permanently inaccessible for these models. Um, one very promising coarse grade model, so there are several ones, but uh, this one has particular advantages and um, was created in, um, in the, uh, the, the, the Oxford Soft Metal Group. Um, um, run by um, R. 
Martin Lewis and uh, Jonathan Loy. Um, the OxDNA model um, models DNA as uh, a rigid body, so every nucleotide instead of 24, 28 atoms, uh, you've got just one uh, nucleotide which has an, an orientation. So this is like one of those uh, units here. Um, as you see, like uh, so this would be more or less just one particle with an orientational, uh, with three orientation degrees of freedom. And um, then you have different effective um, interactions. Um, so the whole approach is top down. That means um, you, you, you don't have a systematic procedure to throw out the degrees of freedom. What you have is you have effective interactions. In, uh, in the current case, six independent interactions, and if you want to have uh, implicit electrostatics via the bihukum, we've got seven uh, independent interactions, and you tune the parameters of these interactions in a way that you reproduce uh, thermodynamic properties, um, for example, like the longitudinal, longitudinal uh, resistance length, um, which is um, like the, the length scale over which the, the DNA strand bends. Uh, and you have the same for, for twist in terms of like the torsional persistence length and then um, melting temperatures when do these uh, duplex, duplexes uh, separate um, and, and form single stranded DNA and all these things. Um, so here's a, here's a sketch of uh, these interactions, um, but I'm going to say more on the next slide. Um, so you have six different interactions. One is obviously the connectivity of the of the single strand, which is the backbone, so it, it runs along um, the, the strand, and this is modeled by Venus springs. Then um, these nucleotides have a, um, a finite extension, so this is modeled by an excluded volume interaction, which is done by a Leonard-Jones potential. And then you've got various um, interactions, like stacking is uh, is, is the most important one, um, um, which controls like actually this twist by the, these nucleotides, they are hydrophobic, so they want to get rid of water, so they squeeze it out and they do this by stacking um, and, and having a, a twist and roll angle uh, between two consecutive uh, nucleotides, and this is controlled by the stacking and um, on different strands with the cross-stacking uh, interaction. And if you have a, a nicked um, uh, duplex, which means um, one strand um, ends here and the, the backbone connectivity is, uh, is broken here between the red one and the, um, the, the yellow one. Um, but you, for example, have a continuous um, single strand on the other side, um, the complementary side, the blue one. So then you get a coaxial stacking interaction. And then, of course, between the two single strands, you have hydrogen bonding. This is done um, by harmonic angle potentials and Morse potential. And the other um, uh, uh, potentials are like a, a product of uh, harmonic angle and harmonic distance um, potentials. So this is the whole thing in a nutshell. The actual potential is um, a little bit more complicated. Um, because you have smoothing, you have uh, truncation, um, you modulate um, these uh, functionals with angle dependencies and so on. And so um, there are lots of angles involved as well. I mean, DNA is uh, not the simplest molecule. Um, and um, of course, I mean, this um, is reflected in the, um, the functional form of this um, interaction. This is, by the way, as well, one of the reasons why this project took um, a little bit longer than you might expect because the interactions um, contain like um, about just below 40 different um, uh, stages that you, you need to go through to, to verify that every every single um, modulation factor when you include that needs to be um, verified. So <clears throat> the if you if you're interested in uh, the full functional form and more details, I recommend um, uh, Thomas Aldridge's um, doctoral thesis which is available uh, from the University of Oxford and, and online. So the title is course Great Modeling of DNA and DNA Self-Assembly. So there you find all these details and uh, more explanations. Um, coming to the performance of this implementation, um, to measure this, we thought about two benchmarks. Um, they may be a little bit artificial, but uh, they work very well to see what's go actually going on, what are the communication patterns, and where does the algorithm spend its time. 
So what we created is just an array of uh, uh, duplexes of double-stranded DNA. Um, looks like this, and this is a, is a, is a win. You can see the, the double um, um, stranded structure. Uh, yeah, and um, so the the we have a low density benchmark which consisted of um, 60 kilobase pairs, and these were arranged in 100 um, DNA duplexes with uh, 60 600 base pairs uh, length each. And then a high density benchmark, which is uh, pretty much 16 times that, um, which uh, gives us uh, just below one megabase pair, um, which is a pretty big system. And um, I mean, this is to, to give you the um, like the current implementation of the OxDNA standalone version, which is um, uh, runs on a on a single GPU, leads to um, system size maximum of uh, 20, 30 kilobase pairs, maybe 50 uh, at maximum. Um, so that would be comparable with our um, yeah, small low density benchmark size. So the power performance is, um, um, is pretty good. Um, what you see here on the right hand side is um, the, the speed up um, compared to uh, the, uh, the performance that you get on, on one single load of Archer, 24 MPI tasks. And um, you see, uh, you get um, like a reasonable speed up. Um, so, for the small benchmark, which is the blue line, um, and you get you, you can achieve speed ups of uh, like uh, several dozens um, uh, if you go uh, compared to like it's not a single core, it's a single node performance. So, if you if you compare that to the single core performance, uh, you you get roughly like um, a speed up. Of more than a factor thousand. Um, for the for the high density benchmark, uh, the speed up goes even further, and um, so you see here uh, it levels off just below um, yeah uh, ten thousand um, MPI tasks. And if you look at the at the power efficiency, is also uh, pretty good. These this this decrease here, I would say more on the uh, on the next two slides. So this decrease here is mainly due to the fact that there are not enough particles on one single core. And so LAMS requires a minimum uh, number of, uh, of particles to, to show a good performance. But it's still like for the high density benchmark, it's still just about 50% um, at uh, 8,192 MPI tasks. So compared to a maximum speed up of a factor 20 or 30 of the GPU version. This is a tremendous gain in performance that we have here with this implementation. Um, looking closer at the performance, um, we did a performance analysis, analysis with the CrayPad um, uh, performance tools on Archer. And for the low density benchmark, you see that um, you got get on a single node, you get a performance which is um, Dominated, uh, fortunately, by the, the compute time. So, according to the LAMPS breakdown, it uh, spends about 86% um, just computing the forces, and uh, just below 5% um, for MPI tasks. Um, something that uh, became pretty clear is that uh, it spent some time uh, calculating the uh, inverse of the cosine. So that is currently 12%, and uh, we're including. Um, early rejection tests and so on, we got it actually down from something um, above 25%. And um, another thing which uh, might be able to be optimized um, uh, is the, uh, the, the conversion of the quaternion degrees of freedom to um, um, a three vector, like a coordinate system, which you need to have to calculate the relative distances and, and angles between the, the individual nucleotides. So it's 11%, but if you, if you, it's calculated for every force, um, for every six of these forces um, individually. So calculating it once and then storing it might be more efficient. So that's maybe the way to go. Um, on 2048 um, MPI tasks, um, the whole thing is uh, dominated by uh, communication. Um, you see that here on the, on the right hand side. Uh, so there's like a, a tremendous weight as well, and um, MPI broadcast is, uh, is about 15%. Um, 
um, the, the, the percentage uh, is, is only 34, uh, 43, sorry, um, of its time that it's spent in, in computing the forces. But uh, the reason is pretty clear. We, we don't have enough um, local atoms on, on every core. Um, and the whole thing is dominated by um, the, the ghost atoms that they need to be carried around. So that uh, is, is obvious, uh, obviously uh, too, too many um, uh, processes for uh, the size of the benchmark. Um, if you look at the high density benchmark, um, it's very well behaved and um, both cases of single node or 2014 MPI tasks, you see that it spends a comparable time in, in computing the forces and uh, communication is of course higher uh, if, you, if you use uh, a larger number of MPI tasks. But um, scaling is, uh, is still very good and the uh, power efficiency is, is in the range of 80% here. So what are the applications of this? Um, these results, by the way, have all been um, achieved with the GPU version. So we can go um, significantly beyond this now with this new implementation. So one thing is um, the gel of DNA, which um, is very interesting because you, uh, you, can, you can design the properties uh, depending on like the, uh, the, the sequence on the complementary strands. And uh, a high density state um, of uh, DNA uh, forms liquid crystalline phases. So that's also quite interesting um, and uh, not very well understood so far. Um, the main advantages of, uh, of this model, I think, are um, in terms of um, DNA nanotechnology. So there are two different fields that you can distinguish. One is, um, is concerned about um, the structure. Um, so uh, static properties, if you want, or like um, um, long-term properties, um, steady-state properties, and the other branch of DNA, DNA uh, nanotechnology um, uh, deals with the dynamics uh, of, of this. And for example, strand replacements um, can be studied with this model. Um, in terms of uh, structural results, you can, you can create uh, really fancy structures like uh, DNA tetrahedra or uh, so-called tiles. So tiles are, uh, yeah, just arrays of, of, of strands uh, with, which, uh, which have uh, specific sequences um, on, on their sides so that you can combine them into more complex, uh, larger objects. And this is shown here in this, um, this these three black uh, figures. So again, tetrahedra, and then uh, for example, like smiley faces and these things. So these are, these are things that became possible about um, 10 years ago, and there's a, there's a big demand in um, knowing um, uh, in advance um, how these systems behave. Um, do they work, uh, these sequences? Uh, do they deliver the desirable um, this desired result, or uh, do you need to tweak something? So, so far in, in experiments, it's, it's a lot of trial and error, and with models like Oxygen A and the SLAMS implementation, um, there will be more predictive um, power in um, determining these things. So the code is distributed via CCP Forge at the moment. Uh, there's a project which is called uh, Coarse Grain DNA Simulation. And uh, you can uh, download it uh, via an anonymous uh, subversion access. Uh, if, if you just type this in, uh, then you, you can download it. You can also join the project, of course. And um, then do a, a, a lot of subversion access so you can access the entire repository and uh, browse everything. Um, in the near future, we will also provide a LAMS user package um, that will be available then uh, with the LAMS distribution and will also contain an extended uh, documentation. And the standalone version is available from, from this web page. There's, there's a lot of um, information about the model as well and what it has been applied to so far. And um, yeah, so uh, the, the idea is to um, um, re replace this, if you want, uh, the standalone version uh, with uh, this LAMPS implementation that, uh, that we developed um, in the longer term. Good, I think that's all I wanted to say. And um, 
again, thanks for your attention, I think. Um, this is the next slide. Um, so, uh, information about user training um, on, on Archer, face-to-face um, -face courses, um, and um, yeah, these tutorials, they're all uh, downloadable from, from the web page and, um, and accessible. And um, the, uh, there's, a, there's a web page, uh, the technical forum, and um, you, can, you can find all previous recordings of this. These webinars. Um, yes, thank you very much for attending this and um, goodbye. And we'd like to hear your feedback about uh, these webinars, of course. Um, if, you, um, if you follow this link here, um, you, can, you can provide this, and um, we hope to see you soon again. Thanks.